Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, welcome to uh, Facebook Live, and here I am, and I'm home today, and I comb my hair and everything, though my hair's still wet, I didn't do anything magic. Um, I got my Pixar t-shirt on, which is a very valuable t-shirt, because uh, you only can get this t-shirt if you go to Pixar, and you can't just walk in off the street, they have to invite you, and Ed Cavill invited me, and I, they have a store there, and you can buy t-shirts, so I got a t-shirt. Anyway, um, just want to check in, hope everybody is doing well. Um, the COVID news in general is pretty good. It's still, it's not like anyone's found a cure, but at least it seems that in most places we are kind of balancing things out a little bit and uh, hopefully that will continue. Uh, places like New York, which is basically the epicenter of the universe with COVID is doing well. Um, hospital admissions are down, deaths are down. ICU beds are down, respirators are down, all sorts of things. So I think in that regard, um, you know, that, that's about as good a news as you can possibly get in these days where, uh, um, as we said before, and everyone has said, it feels like Groundhog's Day. So I think it's important for people to try to maintain some semblance of um, their lifestyle. You can't go shopping, you can't go to the mall, not that I ever went to the mall, but you can't go to meetings, you can't, you don't see friends. You know, things like this is just not a normal existence, but hopefully this will uh, not be all that much longer. But uh, I think what we're trying to do and what I recommend is trying to keep focused and doing um, um, doing as much normal things as you can do and trying to keep yourself challenged. I know the volumes at work are not very high for anybody. The radiology volumes across the country are down 60 to 80 percent. Uh, COVID has not been a major impact in radiology, you know, the CT issues and ultrasound issues, but it's still not big volume. So really no one's working all that hard, though I, in speaking to people, and I'm sure you have the same feeling yourself, people don't concentrate as well as they typically do. And uh, so it makes it a little bit trickier to, uh, to get the work done. So it takes much longer than many people are home and you work, you're reading on a workstation. I mean, the workstations are better. Network connectivity is better. Things like Verizon, AT&T have done a good job. But at the end of the day, um, I, I would say that people aren't as efficient. So it takes longer to do the same amount of work. Um, so anyway, um, let's get back to business here. And I thought I would not speak to you about COVID. So let's speak about renal inflammatory disease. And one thing I've been doing at Hopkins, I've been running a... Um, I always have a faculty meeting every other week where I go over interesting cases. So I've been doing that on Wednesdays at one o'clock for the entire residence faculty fellows, get everybody involved. And so one of the things I was showing some cases on was renal disease. So uh, it's interesting. We tend to think about the kidneys, uh, two big issues, stone disease, roulette obstruction, and hematuria. Is there a tumor present? And so we've given some talks about tumors, the importance of multi-phase imaging, the importance of delayed phase imaging, particularly looking for transitional cell carcinomas. We've done all that. And we've commented, but not to any great detail about renal inflammatory disease. So I thought I would talk about that. So if you talk about polynephritis as the simplest, most common renal infection, most patients who have polynephritis really don't, uh, don't need imaging, right? Um, Patient, it's a diagnosis, clinical, get a urinalysis, it's positive, patients are treated with antibiotics, life goes on. On the other hand, a lot of patients we see, quite frankly, have abdominal pain and it's not really clear where the pains come from. And so often we'll be evaluating an acute abdomen or someone with right upper quadrant pain or left upper quadrant pain. Maybe it's a study to rule out dissection and you'll find the changes of pyelonephritis. So several things to remember. One is non-contrast scans are very good for looking at stones, but non-contrast scans can easily miss pyelonephritis. Now, if pyelo is extensive enough, the kidney's larger, usually it's unilateral, it may be stranding in the peri and pararenal space, and that could be helpful. But you know, for many cases, that's not going to be true, and you need contrast. Uh, if you ask me what's the best phase, probably I would say venous phase. Sometimes people have discussed how pilo will not show well in the early arterial phase, though in the majority of cases it does show well. But the areas of decreased attenuation are maybe best appreciated on the venous phase. Remember that um, a lot of the work, strided nephrograms, which was the classic thing, and we still see on CT, 
was described on plain films by Bosniak on IVPs, which are late phase imaging. So some people have written articles that make the point that the best single phase for seeing infection would be the excretory phase. I think the excretory phase is good, but don't get it too late. So there's a lot of beam hardening and you over or under call, no more than four or five minute delay works well and narrowing the windows becomes critical. So uh, I think that becomes very, very important. I, I do think that the venous and even the arterial phase works very nicely depending which phase you had. And again, you may have arterial phase only because maybe you were doing a dissection. So the classic appearance of pilo is decreased attenuation. It may be somewhat geographic, can be multiple or single areas in the kidney, can be unilateral or bilateral. Obviously, it's usually unilateral. Again, the presence of perirenal space involvement usually means the infection is more extensive. So you may not expect to see that early on. We then talk about um, as, as the disease progresses, you see more perirenal disease. You also see changes in perfusion of the kidney, which becomes more impressive. And sometimes the difference between normal and abnormal kidney becomes much more impressive. Um, we look carefully for stones. We look for things like that. The other thing that happens, quite frankly, is you need to be very careful when you're looking at patients with potential infection is to figure out what else you could be dealing with. So things you could be dealing with also would include infarcts. Now, infarcts, sometimes a good history and the carditis, often it's not a good history. And remember, infarcts can progress to abscesses. And infarcts and infection, dissection, all can present with very similar findings in terms of presentation uh, with flank pain or back pain. So you need to be very, very careful. In terms of uh, embolic, I look carefully at the vessels. And I always do the, carefully at the vessels anyway. Sometimes you can see little clots in the renal artery. Sometimes you can see clots in the left atrium or in the aorta, which might be the sites of seating, but often you don't. Uh, in the kidney, the infarcts can be focal, multifocal, or global. Global infarct is more common with renal artery injuries like trauma or surgery. Most of the ones we see embolic phenomena, they're focal. And again, wedge-shaped, well-defined, particularly early, can be large or can be small, as I said, can be single, or can be multiple, so we need to look at them. And by the way, I see Lidiana, my friend is is saying hi from California, and she's at Stanford, so we we'll say hi there as well. Um, again, if you have questions along the way, I know people tend to be a bit shy and put questions on when this lecture is over, but we're halfway through, so now it's maybe a good time to ask a question, and I'll try to get to it. Um, so that would be the infection and then the infarction. So I, infection is more common than infarction. Infarction tends to be older patients or they have some history of endocarditis, septic emboli, things like that. Also with infarcts, uh, you may see multiple organ involvement. You may see a splenic infarct as well as a hepatic infarct, though splenic is more common. And so you look very carefully. Again, the importance of looking at the multiplanar, the 3D, looking at the renal arteries and its branches, uh, with infection, you're not going to see any cutoff of vessels. With uh, infarcts or embolic changes, you will often. You'll see little cutoffs, and it can be subtle. And we have uh, that um, uh, uh, in, in the teaching file. Of, we just put up a bunch of new cases, and I think we just published or about to publish some uh, lectures on renal inflammatory disease on CT as us. So that should be coming really soon. It hasn't come already. Um, so infarcts and infection, abscesses, you know, they're typically pilo becomes an abscess, hypodense, low density, cystic, thickened wall, all the usual appearances. We have certain unusual infections. I'll just mention two of them, emphyseminous polynephritis, usually in diabetics, it's pretty rare. The pelvis or portions of the cortex or the whole cortex is replaced by air. It could be air in the periopararenal space, emphyseminous polynephritis. Is it a surgical emergency? Patient needs a nephrectomy. Again, it's usually nursing home patients, diabetic patients. That's something you really uh, is uncommon. It's like a home run diagnosis. Uh, sometimes the patients don't have IV contrast, and you just see the air, so it makes it very, very clear what you're dealing with. Okay. Then the other one is anthrogranulomas polynephritis, and it's one of the cases I always show as a quiz on CT is us. Big kidney, typically staghorn calculus. The calyces are markedly dilated, huge dilated calyces. 
Usually it's the whole kidney, but it can be a bit more focal. The calyces are markedly dilated and the fluid is low density. The cortex is markedly thin. And classically, there's no renal function. Though I've seen a bunch of uh, XGPs recently where there is function present. XGP at times when it involves the entire kidney and has no calculi or no central calculi can actually look like a necrotic tumor. So every once in a while, you could potentially make that, that mistake. Things about XGP that have been known for 35 years is it extends into the pararenal space and perirenal space. And the pre-CT days, often the way it was diagnosed was patients would have back pain, the surgeons would palpate a mass, they would go in to drain what is a muscle abscess, and they would follow it deep and it would come from the kidney. So with XGP, you get infection into the peri and pararenal space, which you extend posteriorly and present as a muscle abscess, particularly the paraspinal muscles. That's a really, really classic uh, presentation. Uh, so that's something to think about. I'll also say hi. I'll take the moment to say hi to John Biacchino, one of our terrific techs working through the COVID. And today, John's home in Mace Chapel, which is in uh, uh, Towson, Timonium, part of Baltimore. So I'll say hi there. Um, the uh, other things, uh, I hear footsteps, but uh, I'll ignore the footsteps for a moment. But uh, it, it's it's important. Max, you want to come here and say hi? But, 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 but when can you guys come here? Here, say hi. Come here. This is Max, who's my uh, no, no, assistant. But why, but why I see you on there. I'm speaking to a lot of people, so just say hi and say bye. Well, where are they? They're, they're, they're there. This is on Facebook Live. Didn't they teach you that in school in the pre-kindergarten about Facebook Live? Max, hmm. what did they tell you? Well, there is today is Take Your Kid to Work Day, so... I Max, get back here. Uh, no. Okay. So, bye, Max. You, Thanks for your help. Um, yeah, you know, a, a radiologist in the making. I guess the question is, will it be radiology when he's ready to do radiology? I think, you know, AI will be big in 20-ish years. So, I'll just make that. And everyone says hi to Max. Okay. So, uh, he, you remember they say, not that this is show business, but the two things you don't want to compete with are dogs and kids or pets and kids, not in that order. But uh, anyway, uh, so with XGP, going back to XGP, again, psoas abscesses are very classic. Now, the truth is almost any renal infection extending into the peri and pararenal space can involve the psoas muscles. But these days, with CT and ultrasound being done early, it tends to be uncommon. And again, the XGP is usually a patient in a nursing home, patient not being taken care of well. So that they don't present acutely, and things are overlooked until they really have a problem. So. That's true with both xanthogranulomas pyelonephritis and emphyseminous pyelonephritis. So those are the two uh, really unusual infections. The other thing we've seen, and I showed a couple of cases recently, was TB. Now, in the old days, you have patients had TB more commonly, and you saw that TB of the urinary tract. So what do you see with TB? Sometimes you can see a small, densely calcified, autoinfarcted kidney. That was a sequela of TB. The other thing TB can do is cause a papillitis. The other thing TB can do is cause strictures in the calyces. So at times, and I showed some nice cases, where TB looks very much like a transitional cell carcinoma because you have the calyces narrowed and irregular. The papillitis looking like papillary necrosis, but it's that uh, appearance that becomes uh, very, very classic. So uh, we don't see TB that much. If you're in a part of the world, in Africa, where there's a lot of TB, perhaps you'll see it more commonly but we still do see it. So if I see a stricture in a younger patient and they have pulmonary disease, well, the history just doesn't match. <coughs> it's probably worthwhile, excuse me. It's probably worthwhile to think about the possibility of TB. And we had a case about a couple of years ago where the patient had some confusion, ended up TB of the brain, CNS and kidneys. So, you can see multiple organ involvement, so that's a very important thing to think about as well. Um, in terms of protocols, if you're thinking rule out inflammatory disease, I would still recommend a non-contrast seat to look for stones. I would definitely need to have an excretory phase at the very end of the day to look at the calyces and again for TB, things like that. But I also would do either a, a, a late arterial or a venous, so that's one phase, particularly in younger patients, about 
60 or 70 seconds, which is more venous, would work out fine. That'll give you good cortical medullary differentiation. It would show the early perfusion changes of acute polynephritis and be able to show you any of the complications, which again would be shown on the late phase imaging. On the late phase imaging, excretory phase, four to five minutes, I would make sure I do MIP imaging to look at the calyces. Look very carefully at the papillae. Uh, Satomi Kawamoto wrote an excellent article in papillary necrosis that's in radiographics from last year, worthwhile looking at. And um, things like that you, you want to be considering. So that's kind of renal inflammatory disease. Obviously, you look at the bladder. Sometimes you see stones that pass into the bladder. You look at the ureter. Uh, if you have infection, usually due to obstruction, but if you have an infection from the kidney down, you will see enhancement of the ureter. We always worry about ureteral enhancement as uh, something to make you think about tumors, but infection can do it as well. So you see inflammation in the kidney, renal pelvis, and ureter. Uh, just think of continuous infection. And of course, the bladder can be involved as well. So we never only scan the kidneys. We obviously will scan the bladder as well. And usually the excretory phase works very well there. So that kind of gives you a good look at renal inflammatory disease. As I mentioned, we have a lot of cases. I've been adding a lot of cases. I've added about uh, 2,000 images over the last couple of weeks onto the uh, teaching file on CTSS. I've also, uh, we've also put up a bunch of lectures that are new, including I think renal inflammatory disease or that's coming. There's an acute abdomen which has renal inflammatory disease as well. So take a look at that. And there are other lectures previously done, whether you look on the app, our newest app on the quiz was just approved by Apple the other day for iPhone and iPad, and no, not for uh, Android. Apple said no Android. Um, if Google would like to help us and get the Android versions, we'd be happy to work with them, but we don't have the expertise or the manpower to do it. And that's about it. So I see there's no other questions. We're at our time. I want to thank everybody for their attention. And again, I do ask people as your home, what topics would you like us to discuss? One of the things I'm doing, many of you know, we have a speaker series. I always announce it. So I'll tell you next Thursday at three o'clock, David Abitsky, who basically is the chief evangelist of Amazon, Alexa, and Echo will be speaking with us about how voice becomes critical, both in medicine in general, but particularly in this COVID crisis. And you can think about many ways, things like, uh, the Amazon and Alexa can make a difference. He's going to be live at 3 p.m. Eastern time. With a, Then we'll do a Q&A to follow. It's going to be on Zoom. I'm trying to figure out how to do it because my Zoom account has 300 people, not 3 million people or 3,000 people. So we're going to have to figure it out. We have to have a lottery who can get on and listen to David. Um, and uh, that's about it. So with that, I wish everyone a safe day and a great day. And we'll see you soon.